All right, good to see everybody here today. How many are glad to be in church today? Let's hear it. Some of you are more glad than others, but I get that, okay. How many of you would rather be here than be in jail? Let's hear that. Now, I would follow up that question with how many of you just got out of jail and you came to church today, but I know you, and so I know that many of you did come from jail this weekend. So, but we're so glad to see you today. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Now, Jonathan mentioned about that a week from tomorrow, we start a one-week time of prayer and fasting, and our theme is coming home. We're asking God to bring people here where they will discover a spiritual home, where they'll discover a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we're asking God to give us a home, and um, we're a physical home where we meet and so forth, land building, et cetera. So that's what we're working towards. So I hope you'll be praying about this, and I hope you will join us, uh, because prayer and fasting, according to Scripture, leads to breakthroughs that just regular prayer would not lead to. And so, uh, fasting is not about just uh, going on a diet, uh, but rather it is an intense focus on God. And you say to God, I'm so interested in you answering my prayer. I'm so interested in what you want for my life that I'm willing to forego how I would normally eat. And so, that's what a time of prayer and fasting is about. So, I hope you will join us in that. Well, today we're going to uh, continue. This is actually the eighth message in our series, The Lion, or The Lamb, the Lion, and the Warrior King. And it's about Jesus. We're going through the book of Revelation, and we learned that the lens through which we must see the book of Revelation is we must see it through Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus, it's about the fact that Jesus wins. Now, there, it, there are a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of preachers and teachers that will try to teach the book of Revelation from a scary standpoint. In other words, they'll make it about events rather than the person of Jesus Christ. But we find out in the very first few words of the book of Revelation, it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's about Jesus. Now, if you read about all these events, the seals and the bowls and the trumpets, and you see all this judgment coming, it might be very scary to you. But let me just encourage you. This book was written to a real group of people by John the Apostle, um, a follower of Jesus, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and it was around 95 AD, and this group of people, they were being persecuted. Uh, You know, we look at our culture around us, and we watch the news, and we're like, man, how can things be any worse? And we get all up in arms. Well, trust me, back in those days, if you've read any history, you know that it was a lot worse than it is today in our culture. And it was especially worse for Christians. And so, how can this be a comfort? Because this is really a book, it was a letter that was written to these real Christians, and it was written to seven churches How can this book that describes demonic locusts uh, coming up out of the earth and stinging people with their stingers, which there's a lot of metaphorical language in the book of Revelation, how can that be an encouragement? How can that be a blessing to read about it? Well, just put yourself in their situation. If at, at that time you lived under the cruel heel of the Roman Empire, would it not be a comfort to you to know that eventually Jesus wins? Would it not be a comfort to you to know that no matter what injustice you may have faced at the hand of the government, no matter what injustice you may have faced at the hand of people in business with you uh, that reject your belief in God, reject your Christianity, reject your uh, beliefs and your morals and all this, would it not be a comfort to you to know that Jesus actually does? hold them to account. He actually does bring things to justice one day. So that's what the book is about. Well, today, I'm going to talk to you on this thought, the God of second chances. The God of second chances. And this will be 
the eighth message, and it's the seventh church. Jesus actually told John what to write to these seven churches, and they're in uh, Asia Minor. We would call that modern-day Turkey. And so this was the last one. It's a very famous one, and you've heard a lot of preaching about this. It's about the church at Laodicea, and I'm going to tell you as we interpret the Scripture correctly, it's not what you think it's about. There's been a lot of bad application uh, and a lot of bad interpretation from this passage, and I want to show you that it's really not what you think it is, it's something completely different, okay? But we're going to talk about the God of second chances. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is a God of second chances, my dad was an alcoholic, and uh, he, he was headed toward death. Our family was going to be destroyed. There's no doubt about it. And one day, uh, Jesus came into the scene, and my dad got saved, and God delivered him and gave us a second chance. And I'm just so thankful for that. You, too, know that God is a God of second chances. There's some of you that have struggled with an addiction, or you've struggled, struggled with something you need to be delivered from. I remember the very first time that I ever was exposed to pornography. I was 10 years old. And my uncle, he had all this stuff, and it was very graphic. And he had a walk-in closet, and there were these big pictures on the walls. And I remember I was in the house by myself. It was my grandma's house. And I, I walked in there, and it scared me to death. In fact, it scared me so bad, I turned around and ran. And after I ran about 10 feet, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I kind of like what I saw there, and I went back and looked at it. Well, that led to a period in my life where I really struggled with that. And uh, I, I want you to understand that God, if he can deliver me, he can deliver you. It is no matter what it is. Um, there are some of you that you know this. Before you started coming to Stillwater's Church, for many of you, you had not been in church for years. Some of you a year, some of you longer, some of you many years. And you know that even though if someone had asked you, do you love Jesus? You would say, yeah, of course I love Jesus. You know that you really weren't acting like it and God gave you a second chance. You came here and you got reconnected. And the point is this, and don't miss this. God is a God of second chances. And so no matter the sin, Jesus can forgive. No matter the sin, Jesus will forgive you if you'll ask. No matter the failure, Jesus can cover it. You may have failed spectacularly, and most of us have, and Jesus can cover that. No matter the bondage, Jesus can set you free. He is a God of second chances. And I'm going to say that again because I was expecting a little bit better reaction than that some of you are still hung over from last night, okay? So kind of elbow the person next to you. Everybody do that. Let me see it. Let me see it. Elbow the person next to you. And I'm going to give you another chance because God's a God of second chances and Pastor Richie is a pastor of second chances, okay? So I don't want to leave you hanging out there. I want you to feel like a failure. When I gave you a, when I teed one up for you, you missed it. You whiffed, okay? So I'm going to do it again. And we're going to see if we can knock a home run. All right, ready? God is a God of second chances. There we go. More like the Braves. All right, good deal. Which, by the way, we're hoping that they win their division and the World Series again. All right, so, and if you don't hope that, then uh, you're not welcome at this church. All right, so... <laughs> Let, let me tell you uh, about what we're going to read today. Uh, the church at Laodicea, and you've heard this preached so many times, where uh, it says there that you're neither uh, hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That Greek word, by the way, and it doesn't say it in the translation we're reading today, but the Greek word actually means vomit. God said, Jesus said, you're not hot or cold, and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because of it. Okay, now you need to understand what that means because it doesn't mean what we think it does. Because I've heard this preached this way. What Jesus was saying was, if you're not on fire for God, or if you're not cold on God, you're just lukewarm, you're just halfway in, 
that Jesus, you make him sick. Well, that's not what that means at all. Because I can't imagine any scenario where Jesus would say, you know what, I'm pretty okay if you're cold spiritually. There is no scenario where Jesus would say, you know what, I wish that you weren't so close to me. I wish that you were neglecting your faith. Jesus would never say that. So that can't be possibly what it means. So we're going to read about this church and what they were struggling with. And what had happened was, as we're going to see from this text, they had become a bad taste in the mouths of non-believers. Now think about this. This church had become off-putting to lost people. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, you know, I've seen some churches that, um, that they'll say, we welcome everyone. We're one of those churches. We say that our goal is to reach people no matter where they are uh, and have them come into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We talk about that we embrace the mess because we know that life is messy. But the fact is, uh, often what happens is churches will become either so deluded in their beliefs that they make no difference in the world. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but lost people, people that need Jesus Christ, they are put off by a couple of different brands of Christianity. And one brand is the holier than thou. I'll use that terminology. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, that holier than thou, it's not that uh, we say, oh, we embrace sin. That's not what we say, okay? Holier than thou says, I see the sin in your life, but I don't recognize the sin in mine. That's what that means. That's also known as hypocrisy, okay? So that is a complete and utter turnoff to lost people. It will put a bad taste in their mouth, okay? And, and then there are uh, what I call the rock throwers, the chunkers, okay? And every, they may not even say, they may not even deny they have sin, but boy, everything in culture becomes World War III and they have to chunk rocks at it. And of course, that is a turnoff to people because why should you expect people who are not Christians to act like Christians, okay? That's not the way it works. What they need is they need the love of Jesus Christ. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ in their life that will radically change their lives, okay? So uh, there are people that are uh, the, the, the holier than thou, the rock throwers. But as I also said, there are those that are so deluded and, and watered down in their belief they make no difference at all. You see, you may not realize this, but what lost people look for in a witness, what lost people look for in someone that claims to be a Christian is something that has made a difference in their life. They don't want somebody to come in and point out all their sin and ignore theirs. They know they've got sin in their life. They don't need somebody to throw rocks at them. That's not what they need at all. And they definitely don't need a person that says, you know, I'm a Christian, and it makes no difference in their life. It makes no difference in how they live and how they love and how they react. So that puts a bad taste in the mouths of non-believers. So let's read uh, this text here and see what it says. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the amen. The word amen means truth. You've heard it said it means so be it. It, does, it can mean that, but it means truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said the words of the amen, the faithful. Aren't you glad that Jesus is faithful? He's faithful to forgive. He's faithful to love. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, I am the true witness. He's the witness to the love that God the Father has for you and me. And he says that I am the beginning of God's creation. That does not mean that God created him. No, no. Father, Son, and Spirit, the three persons of the one triune God, uh, the fact is they had perfect fellowship and perfect harmony and uh, by the way, that's really the reason why that you and I 
crave human relationships. We crave a relationship with God. That's why God designed us in his image so that we could be relational people. Uh, You can't go without having church. And the point is not that, you know, that you can't get uh, a Christian song somewhere or that you can't even hear preaching online. You certainly can. But the fact is, one of the most important things about church is that relational aspect that God has designed you for. And so, uh, God designed us in his image, and Jesus was there at creation. That's what he's saying, that he is, he is the beginning of the creation. He said, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. And as I already told you, that word in Greek literally should be translated vomit. He's going to upchuck, all right? Can't keep his lunch down. You know what I'm saying? He's going to blow chunks. All right, that's what it's saying, all right? And in the Greek, it doesn't really say blow chunks, but vomit, that's what it means, right? So you see that he said that um, not only does it create a bad taste in the mouth of non-believers, but it also creates a bad taste in the mouth of God. He said, for you say, now this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where he starts to tell them what they need to do. He says, for you say I'm rich and I've prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. And the reason he chose these specific words, I'm going to reveal to you in just a moment. It's very interesting why he used these words. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve for, to anoint your eyes that you may see. So he's saying, they say they're rich, but he said, you're not, you're broken, you're poor. He said, you say that you're healthy, but you're not. And he even uses the metaphor here of our eye salve, of anointing your eyes so that you can see. So he's telling them what they need. He said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. We know the word repent means to change your mind. It means to agree with God. He says, you need to start thinking like I think, okay? He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will eat with him. By the way, way, that Greek word, in some of the the older translations, it says, I will sup with him. I will sup with him. Um, And that's where the old southern expression supper comes from. How many know what supper is? All right. How many know that there's a difference between uh, lunch and supper, or dinner and supper, okay? You Yankees, you say dinner for the evening meal. It's supper, okay? And we have Jesus' word on it, all right? That's what I'm saying. Now, now let, me, let me just kind of explain this to you. When he said that I'll come in and sup with you, um, in the ancient world, in the, in the Hebrew life, they didn't eat a very big breakfast, just a little something to kind of break the fast of night. And uh, then they would eat kind of a small lunch. Um, oh, I don't know, sometimes loaves and fish. Anybody ever remember that? Five loaves, two fish, feeding 5,000 men, right? And so that was a typical Jewish morning and lunch, breakfast and lunch. But man, at nighttime, you know what they did? It was the big meal of the day. And not only was it the big meal of the day, it was the time that the family got together and fellowshiped. It was the time that you talked to one another. It was the time that you shared with each other. It was a big deal. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if you'll open the door, I'm going to come in and I'm going to hang out. I'm going to be with you, and we're going to share, and we're going to love each other, and we're going to enjoy our time together, and it's going to be awesome. I don't know about you, but I would love to have that with Jesus. 
Wouldn't you love to have that? I mean, the fact is at the end of the day when things are tough and maybe you've had a tough day and and people have been disagreeable, you've had a grouchy boss, you broke something at work and you come home and you're tired and you're upset and there's Jesus and he's wanting to hang out and he's wanting to talk to you. He wants to sup with you. That's what he's saying. He said, so if if you'll open the door, and by the way, there are many pastors, and I've been guilty of this before. It's not, not necessarily a bad application, but Jesus is not talking to lost people. I've used this verse before, probably incorrectly, uh, to say that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. If you open the door of your heart, he'll come in and he'll save you. Well, he will if you open the door of your heart, but he was talking to Christians here. This was a church. These were believers. And so he said, the one who conquers... I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And by the way, he's talking about the spiritual ear that the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart. So what is God saying to you? This is what he's saying. Listen to what I'm saying. And we see at the end of each of these challenges that Jesus gives to these churches At the end of each one, he says to the one that conquers, to the one who overcomes, you need to understand, it's not a works-based salvation that Jesus is talking about. He is reminding us to turn to him because he is the one that has conquered. He is the one that overcomes. He is the one that we put our faith in. So he's just simply reminding us to go back and to trust him, to go back and to believe in him, to go back and put our faith in In him. And by the way, that is not elementary Christianity. That is advanced PhD level Christianity. I know a lot of Christians that are like, well, you know, we need to move on from teaching about the gospel all the time. We get that. We want some spiritual meat. You don't get any more spiritual meat than the gospel. You really don't. And when you realize that what Jesus is telling you is to go back to that same kind of faith in every area of your life, in every aspect of your life, that that's what makes the difference in your life. So I've already set this up, so the points won't be very long, all right? So let me just tell you what Jesus is saying to this church. Uh, He's saying that they've lost their voice in the community. They've lost their influence in the community. They had become a bad taste in the mouths of not only Jesus, but of non-believers. And what Jesus is saying, I think it's really two things to this church. He said, the people around you are looking for two things. They're looking for authenticity and they're looking for transparency. In other words, uh, they're looking for uh, people that have transformed lives. They're looking not for perfect people, but for people that have had an experience with the living God. And yes, they're not perfect, and yes, they still fail, and yes, they still sin, but God has promised that they have been forgiven, and their life has been radically and completely transformed. And even though they're still gonna go through the difficulties of life, they're still gonna have loved ones die. They're still gonna struggle with when the economy goes bad. They're still gonna have relationship struggles. What Jesus is saying is this, that it is necessary for us as believers and as a church to be a good taste in the mouths of non-believers. Now I'm gonna explain this to you uh, in, in just a, hopefully a way that I believe we all understand. Uh, they had said that they were rich and in need of nothing. So in other words, they were like, they were complacent. And God challenges a complacent church. He says, do not believe that it's okay for you not to be involved in the community and reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we use the phrase, inviting is evangelism. It is critically important that we as a church, that we do that. And we're gonna be doing some things over the next several months that are gonna assist you in this. Um, But they said they had no need of anything. This is a very prideful and arrogant statement because they didn't have any water. I don't know about you, but a city 
that has no water is not going to last very long. And so what did they do? Well, they did two things. One, uh, they built an aqueduct from Hierapolis, which was, you know, miles away. And this city was known for its hot springs, the mineral springs. And you could go there and you could sit in that hot springs and it was very therapeutic and very healthy and very good for you. So what they did is they piped in through this aqueduct, this hot water, and guess what it became after it went miles and miles and miles? It became lukewarm. Now, I don't know about you, but hot springs mineral water is not good to drink, right? And it's only therapeutic when you're able to sit in that hot water and it helps you. And so it, it had lost its effectiveness. And then from Colossae, which is another city that was not too awful far away, um, they uh, piped in cold water. Colossae was known for its pure, cold water. Ah, refreshing. I don't know if you've ever been to like a mountain spring and you drink that really good, sweet, cold water when you're thirsty. Man, it's so refreshing. But by the time it got to Laodicea, you know what had happened to it? Not only was it lukewarm, but it had become filled with sediment. And in fact, there was a famous saying about Laodicea. And here was the saying, if you drink the water, you're going to vomit. <laughs> that was their saying. Uh, I'm not sure that's a very good slogan to get people to visit your city, okay? What if Orlando did that? You know, the place of all these places of entertainment. Uh, if you come to Orlando, you're going to vomit, all right? If you go to Disney World when you get the bill, you're going to vomit, all right? That's probably true. But the point is this. They said they had all this stuff together, and they did not. Their act wasn't together. They said, we don't have any need of anything. They were complacent. Listen to what Psalm 34, verse 8 says. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so this metaphor becomes obvious then. Jesus said, you're not hot. You're not like a mineral springs that is healthy and comforting to people. You're not cold. You're not a cool, refreshing drink of water, but your water is just filled with sediment. It's gross. There are places in Florida. Kim and I, uh, well, Kim is from Florida, and I lived there for about 13 years. And there are places in Florida, not too far from Jacksonville, where we lived, that have sulfur water. Anybody ever drank sulfur water before? You ever had that? That is the most disgusting stuff you've ever had in your life. And there are people there that got used to it. And I can remember going to the people's houses, and they would take that sulfur water and make coffee. That's sacrilegious to abuse the nectar that God has put on this earth for our benefit, coffee. And you put salt, you make it with sulfur water? God should judge that. I just want you to know that. And this is exactly what had happened to this city. It would be like drinking sulfur water. Or you get a, a glass of cool iced tea and you go to drink it and it smells like a gopher threw up in it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, ugh, put that away. Well, the obvious point is this, that the world around us they need to have the experience of tasting the goodness of God and seeing the goodness of God in order for our witness to be effective. That's what he's saying. So I've got three points. I'm going to be done in about seven minutes, okay? And I realize this was a long setup, but I want to show you what Jesus was saying to this church to become what God wanted them to be, to become cool refreshing water that helps people or to become the hot mineral springs that are beneficial and healthy to people so that we are able to take the gospel in an effective way. There are three things he told them to do. Number one, he said, seek spiritual wealth. Now listen to what he said. You say that I'm rich and I've prospered and I need nothing uh, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. 
It's very interesting that he chose these words because in the city of Laodicea, they had the largest banking system of all the seven cities that Jesus uh, spoke to, these churches. They had the largest banking system of all. They were very well known for their, are you ready for this? Gold. I don't know why I said it that way, gold. That was kind of weird. Um, becoming very preachery. You ever notice that some preachers don't say God, they say God. And so these people were known for their gold, all right? Now, he said, buy from me gold refined by fire. Let let me tell you what Jesus is referring to. Isaiah chapter 55, verse one. And I want you to get this because this is very helpful. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And uh, he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Hold on. They made a mistake. Because Isaiah, when he wrote this, uh, he said, if you don't have any money, come and buy something to eat. Now, I don't know about you, but if you don't have any money, you ain't buying nothing, all right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I can remember when I was a teenager going out at times and uh, people would uh, stop at McDonald's and I didn't have any money. You ever been there? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not hungry. And that was a lie because I was 16 years old. And I could eat a doorknob, all right? I was so hungry all the time. But I didn't have any money, and you know what? I wasn't buying anything. But you know what Jesus is talking about here? You know what? I, this was a, a future prophecy about Jesus Christ. He said, come and buy uh, uh, and eat. Come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Can you guess what he's talking about? He's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because for you and me, it doesn't cost anything. It costs Jesus everything, but it costs us simply our faith. Now now get this, he's he's saying this. And this is the key. He's saying that they were to seek spiritual wealth. How do you seek spiritual wealth? Through faith, through trusting God. Through reminding yourself that it costs Jesus everything, but it's free for us. And so that's what he's saying. What you and I need to do is to get back to understand that Jesus paid for it with his blood. He has uh, blessed us. He has given us grace. He has given us an opportunity to receive forgiveness, to be made right with God. And when by faith we begin to seek spiritual wealth, then we can buy it with gold refined in the fire. We can buy it without price. Uh, So he's not losing his mind when he says this. Listen to 1 Peter 1, 7. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire testify or tests rather and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold so when your faith remains strong through many trials you get it gold and faith and trials we're trusting God it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world what he's saying is Jesus is going to be really proud of you now what you think about this there are Christians in this world that think they need nothing. They think they're okay. They think they can make it on their own. They think they're strong enough. They think they're rich enough. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're poor. Without me, he said, you can do nothing. Nothing. But when you put your faith in me, that is seeking true spiritual wealth. Isn't that good? He, he said, seek spiritual wealth. Here's the second thing. He said, seek spiritual health. By the way, they had the largest banking system. But they also had the largest medical center in school in this city. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, you need to seek some spiritual health. And particularly, he said, you're blind. Get some eye salve and put on your eyes. You know what's interesting about this medical school that was the largest in that part of the world? You know what they're famous for? Ophthalmology, seeing, uh, getting help with their eyes. And, And I don't want you to miss this. What Jesus is saying to us is this, that we need to make sure that we see what God sees. We seek spiritual health, not spiritual perfection. 
Do not be sucked into that because when you become a Christian, you become a follower of Jesus, yes, God forgives you, God redeems you, and uh, that, that's true, but you still have a sinful nature. You're still going to fail, okay? And that's not an excuse, but what he's saying is that we need to seek spiritual health, not spiritual perfection. You know how I know if you're unhealthy or a Christian is unhealthy? When they pretend that they don't have any issues. When they pretend there's nothing wrong in their life. When they pretend that everything is just peaches and cream. You know what? I don't trust people that are always happy. Now, I'm a happy person. You can ask my wife, except for when, I, when I'm mad, all right? So, but I don't trust, you know, these people that are like, oh, yes, so oh, it's so wonderful. And I'm like, yeah, I pretty much don't trust you. I mean, these people that they hit their thumb with a hammer and it's like, oh, praise Jesus. No, I don't say that. I'm not going to tell you what I say. You wouldn't go to this church anymore, okay? So he's not talking about spiritual perfection. He's talking about spiritual health. Listen to what uh, it says in Ezekiel 12 too. You shall dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see. Hmm, it's interesting. That's in that passage, isn't it? But see not who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. You know what God's saying? This spirit of rebellion will keep you from spiritual health. This spirit of rebellion against God, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you about something that Scripture shows us, he says, have spiritual ears to hear and spiritual eyes to see. Pride causes spiritual blindness. By the way, you know how we know that's true? Remember Jesus telling the story about the Pharisee and the, uh, the sinner, and the sinner prayed, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He was a, a publican, was, is actually used in uh, older translations. He was a publican, not a republican, but a publican. He was a tax collector, okay? He was a part of the IRS. How many know that that's wicked? All right, you know what I'm saying? All right, look. My youngest daughter, Brooke, when she got her first job, um, she was so excited and she had earned this paycheck and she came home and she was in tears. I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? She goes, somebody stole my money. I said, what do you mean? She said, I don't know who FICA is, but I hate him. Well, the Pharisee on the other hand, you know what he prayed? God, I thank you that I'm not like this wicked sinner. Pride. You know what Jesus said? Seek spiritual wealth and spiritual health. And then finally, seek spiritual clothing. It's all right there in the, in the text. Uh, they had also, <laughs> interestingly enough, as you might guess, they were the, this city was the largest clothing manufacturer in the known world at that time. That's interesting. They had the biggest banking system but they were broke. They had the greatest medical center, the medical training school, but they were not healthy. And here they had uh, the biggest clothing manufacturing place. And the idea is simple, that when you're more concerned, this is the crux of the message, when you're more concerned with your appearance, and I'm not talking about the way your hair looks, but of how people perceive you than you are of how God perceives you, then you're in trouble. You, you ever, I've, I've struggled with that before. Opportunity to witness, opportunity to uh, share the, the, my story with others, opportunity to invite people in. And I was intimidated because like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to hear that. Oh, they'll just reject that. Or I'm afraid they'll make fun of me more interested in what people think than what God thinks. And, and, and I can just say this with all confidence, that you and I, if we want to seek spiritual clothing, we cannot live our lives in that manner. Listen to Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me there it is, with garments of salvation. 
In other words, he's resting in the fact that God is the one who saves. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. By the way, that's not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the more I result, uh, re, re, uh, rejoice in that, the better off I am. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Now, let me, let me just end with this. Remember I said that we often misapply this passage. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come in to him or her, and I will sup with him. Everybody say sup. Sup. Not what's up, but sup. All right? You know what Jesus is saying? That when you seek spiritual wealth and spiritual health and spiritual clothing, you're opening the door of your heart and say, Jesus, come on in and let's hang out. Come on in, let's, let's fellowship. Let's share the joys together. Let's share this look on life that you want me to have. Let me hang out with you and fellowship and have joy. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Christianity I want. Not this stuffy, um, pretend, holier than thou, acting as if everything in my life is perfect. It's not but I sure do want to hang out with Jesus. And I sure do want him to be there with me. And I'm going to do my best to seek spiritual wealth and spiritual health and spiritual clothing because when I do, Jesus comes in. Heavenly Father, help us all to open the door of our heart to fellowship with you to love you, and to know you more. Before I finish my prayer, and, and I even talked about misapplying this verse. I'm not trying to misapply this verse. But there are some of you that need to open your heart to Jesus today. If you'd say, Pastor, I'd like to do that, online or in the room, say something like this to God. Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God and you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and to change me, to save me right now. And if you'll pray that prayer and ask Jesus into your life, he'll answer that prayer without question. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've been, uh, no matter what your past is like, Jesus says, I will save you if you'll ask. And so you invite Jesus into your life today online, check at the bottom of the screen that you pray to receive Christ today. In the room, fill out the next step card and uh, drop it in the bucket. We'll have two ushers, one by each exit on the way out. and they'll have, a, they'll have a little bucket. You can just drop it right in there on the way out. And Jesus, we want you to know that we love you and we want to open the door of our heart. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.